You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Hey everyone, thanks for downloading episode 85 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all, welcome to the podcast. With the last show and our discussion of the Trent Affair, Rich and I reached the end of 1861 on the podcast timeline. So as promised, we're devoting this episode and also the next to a look back at the first year of the war. Way back around episode 23 or 24, we rolled over from 1860 to 1861, and then we hit Fort Sumter at episode 30. And between then and now, Tracy and I have covered a lot of material, and in the process, jumped around quite a bit, looking at a number of different issues, discussing a wide variety of topics, taking the time to explore the people and events that made the first year of the Civil War so dramatic and significant. And so, since we did cover a lot of material and jump around quite a bit in the last 50 or so episodes, we thought it would be a good idea if we devoted a show or two to a review, a look back at 1861, really just focusing on the chronological flow of events so that you guys can get a feel for the timeline, uh, a feel for how events unfolded during the first year of the war. So that's what we're going to do with this show and the next. We'll go month by month and give y'all an overview of what all happened in 1861. We won't spend very much time on any one event. We'll just focus on painting the big picture for y'all. Tuesday, January 1st, 1861. There was the usual New Year's Day reception taking place at the White House, but it was an overcast and dismal day in Washington, and it wasn't just the weather that dampened people's spirits. By January 1861, the United States of America was beginning to tear apart. The 1860 presidential election had had four candidates, all from parties that had either fractured or coalesced around questions relating to the expansion of slavery into new territories. The Republicans, having just organized six years before, were running their second presidential campaign, and their candidate, Abraham Lincoln, won the 1860 election. Since that day in early November 1860, the states of the Deep South had started to make good on their threat to secede from the Union if the Republican candidate won the election. On December 20th, South Carolina was the first to go. In language to be echoed by other seceding states, the South Carolina Secession Convention justified its action on the ground that, when Lincoln became president, then, quote, the slaveholding states will no longer have the power of self-government or self-protection, and the federal government will have become their enemy, end quote. The slave and free states shared the same language, legal system, political culture, social mores, and religious values, as well as a common heritage of struggle to form the nation. But the one thing they did not share was slavery. You guys might remember that we answered the question, what caused the Civil War, by saying secession. And what caused secession? Well, at the time, the secessionists themselves made it very clear that it was their concern over the future of slavery which led to their calls for disunion. And so Tracy and I want to be very clear that we think that if you honestly examine the historical evidence, then you can't escape concluding that the Civil War was not fought over issues of states' rights, or the tariff, or banks, or agrarianism versus industrialism. No, 
In his second inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln would say that it was slavery which was at the heart of the split between North and South, and Southerners agreed with Lincoln that it was their peculiar institution that created the House Divided. Alexander Stevens, the Confederate Vice President, famously declared in a speech that slavery was the cornerstone of the Confederacy. In the winter of 1860-1861, the advocates of secession bluntly expressed the reasoning behind their desire to leave the Union and their willingness to risk a shooting war with the North. As Charles Dew has shown in his book, Apostles of Disunion, it was the protection of slavery and white supremacy that was clearly the dominant theme of secession rhetoric. And so, with the 1860 presidential election, after decades of rising tension over the issue of the expansion of slave territory, the breaking point had finally been reached. Despite the fact that Abraham Lincoln had fairly won the election, Southern fire eaters were willing to break the bonds of union in order to protect their system of enslaved labor, which was much more than the basis of their wealth. It was their means of maintaining racial control and white supremacy. On the first day of 1861, many of the Southerners attending the New Year's Day reception at the White House surely wondered if the gathering was to be their farewell to Washington society. Everyone knew the lame duck president, James Buchanan, was struggling to deal with events in newly seceded South Carolina, where, less than a week earlier at Charleston, Major Robert Anderson had moved his small garrison of federal soldiers from vulnerable Fort Moultrie to the more secure Fort Sumter. Anderson had hoped the transfer to the stronghold out in the middle of the harbor would ease tensions by lessening the chance of an attack on his command, but the South Carolinians had been enraged by the move and saw it as a provocation. At an important meeting on January 2nd, Buchanan and his cabinet agreed that reinforcements should be sent to Fort Sumter, but General-in-Chief Winfield Scott advised that they be sent on a fast merchant steamer rather than on a warship. And so three days later, on the 5th, the chartered civilian vessel Star of the West left New York, bound for Fort Sumter with supplies and 250 troops. On that same day in Washington, senators from Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, and Florida held a caucus and advised their states to secede from the Union and form a Southern Confederacy. On Tuesday, January 8th, Secretary of the Interior Jacob Thompson of Mississippi, the last Southerner left in Buchanan's cabinet, resigned. Thompson, along with others, telegraphed Charleston and alerted the South Carolinians that the Star of the West was on her way to Fort Sumter. Also on the 8th, the President sent a message to the House and Senate saying he felt the present situation was beyond executive control and calling for prompt action by Congress to resolve the crisis before it ended in war. But, although in defusing each previous dispute over slavery, Congress had established a tradition of sectional compromise, this time the intransigence of the Southern fire eaters and the rapid succession of events meant that this Congress would be unable to craft a political solution to the escalating crisis. The Star of the West, with reinforcements and supplies for Fort Sumter, arrived off Charleston Harbor about midnight on January 8th. At daylight the next morning, the 9th, the ship, flying the Stars and Stripes, steamed up the main channel toward the fort, but she was fired upon by a battery of South Carolina artillery on the north end of Morris Island. After being hit, the Star of the West turned about and headed back out to sea. Also on that same day, January 9th, Mississippi became the second state to secede. And then on the 10th, the Florida State Convention passed an ordinance of secession. Alabama was the next to go on January 11th. And so in the space of just three days, Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama had joined South Carolina in leaving the Union. On the 11th, President-elect Lincoln wrote to a Republican congressman that, quote, now we are told in advance the government shall be broken up unless we surrender to those we have beaten before we take the offices. If we surrender, it is the end of us, end of the government. End quote. On January 13th, Governor Pickens of South Carolina asked Washington for $3,000 due to him for his previous service 
as the United States ambassador to Russia. Proving that someone in Washington had a sense of humor, he was sent a draft payable at the Charleston Sub-Treasury, which was one of the federal facilities that had already been seized by the South Carolinians. On January 19th, Georgia became the fifth state to leave the Union when its state convention at Milledgeville voted 208 to 89 in favor of an ordinance of secession. That same day, the Mississippi legislature called for a convention of representatives from the seceding states. On Monday, January 21st, in a dramatic and moving scene in the Senate chamber, five senators from Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi gave their farewell speeches. The last man to speak was Jefferson Davis, who said, quote, I concur in the action of the people of Mississippi, believing it necessary and proper, and should have been bound by their action if my belief had been otherwise. I am sure I feel no hostility to you, senators from the North. I am sure there is not one of you, whatever sharp discussion there may have been between us, to whom I now cannot say, in the presence of God, I wish you well. Mr. President and Senators, having made the announcement which the occasion seemed to me to require, it only remains for me to bid you a final adieu. End quote. Five days later, on January 26th, Louisiana became the sixth state to secede. State troops had already seized the U.S. arsenal at Baton Rouge, as well as Forts Jackson and St. Philip, which were strategically located on the Mississippi River below New Orleans. Even as states of the Deep South were seceding one after another, Congress voted on January 29th to admit Kansas to the Union as the 34th state. On the first day of February 1861, Texas's secession convention voted in favor of leaving the Union. In accordance with the legislature's requirements, though, the convention called for a vote by the people to be held on the 23rd. From his home in Springfield, Illinois, President-elect Lincoln, who had run pledging not to touch slavery where it already existed, but opposed to its spread into the territories, wrote privately to William H. Seward, quote, I say now, however, as I have all the while said, that on the territorial question, that is the question of extending slavery under the national auspices, I am inflexible, end quote. Lincoln said he opposed any compromise, quote, which assists or permits the extension of the institution on soil owned by the nation, end quote. On February 4th, representatives from six of the seven states that had seceded met in Montgomery, Alabama. The delegates from Texas wouldn't arrive until after that state's vote on the 23rd, but representatives from South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana began deliberations that would, in short order, culminate in the creation of a southern slaveholding republic, the Confederate States of America. Also on the 4th, the Peace Convention, suggested by Governor John Letcher of Virginia, began to meet in Washington. Delegates from 21 states attended the conference, but like Congress's latch-ditch attempts to find a compromise, the Peace Convention's efforts will also ultimately be for naught. None of the seven seceded states were represented at the conference, and several northern states chose not to participate. Counting down the days until he could pass the responsibility for the escalating secession crisis to Abraham Lincoln, James Buchanan nevertheless announced on February 5th that under no circumstances will Fort Sumter be surrendered to South Carolina. Down in Montgomery, on Fed Friday, February 8th, the Convention of Seceding States unanimously adopted the Provisional Constitution of the Confederate States. The next day, the delegates unanimously chose Jefferson Davis to be the provisional president of the CSA and selected Alexander Stevens of Georgia for vice president. Meanwhile, also on the 9th, Tennessee voters rejected the proposal to call a secession convention by a vote of 68,200 to 59,400. On February 10th, at his home in Mississippi, not far from Vicksburg, Jefferson Davis received a telegram informing him that he had been named President of the Confederate States of America. Davis departed the next day for Montgomery. <laughs> 
By one of those odd coincidences that sometimes pop up with historical events, President-elect Lincoln also departed his home on February 11th on his inaugural journey. In the early morning drizzle, more than a thousand citizens of Springfield gathered at the train station to listen to an emotional Abraham Lincoln tell them, quote, Here I have lived a quarter of a century and passed from a young man to an old. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being, whoever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you, As I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. On February 16th, forced by the haphazard layout of the South's railroads to follow a roundabout route to Alabama, a deeply tired Jefferson Davis finally arrived in Montgomery. Upon his arrival, William Lowndes Yancey famously proclaimed, The man and the hour have met. Two days later, on Monday, the 18th, as Abraham Lincoln passed through New York State from Buffalo to Albany, Jefferson Davis was inaugurated as Provisional President of the Confederate States of America. Writing to his wife of the event, Davis said, quote, The audience was large and brilliant. Upon my weary heart was showered smiles, plaudits, and flowers. But beyond them I saw troubles and thorns innumerable. We are without machinery, without means, and threatened by a powerful opposition, but I do not shrink from the task imposed upon me. End quote. Jefferson Davis went to work the next day to form his cabinet. It took some time, but he eventually chose a man from each of the other six seceded states to fill the half dozen posts. When the Washington Evening Star reported on Davis's initial cabinet choices, it played upon one aspect of what would emerge as the new Confederate president's management style, a reluctance to delegate. The newspaper's tongue-in-cheek roster listed, For Secretary of State, Honorable Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. War and Navy, Jeff Davis of Mississippi. Interior, Ex-Senator Davis of Mississippi. Treasury, Colonel Davis of Mississippi. Attorney General, Mr. Davis of Mississippi. One day after he was warned that a plot existed to kidnap or assassinate him as he traveled through Baltimore, Maryland, President-elect Lincoln left Pennsylvania for Washington on the night of February 22nd rather than the following afternoon as originally scheduled. He took special precautions and passed through Baltimore without incident, but after arriving in Washington on the morning of the 23rd, Lincoln immediately began to regret the final circumspect portion of his journey, which quickly became fodder for unfriendly political cartoonists. As President-elect Lincoln arrived in Washington on Saturday the 23rd, the voters of Texas went to the polls, and they approved secession in the referendum that was ordered by the legislature and the state convention. On Monday, February 25th, Abraham Lincoln attended a reception in both the House and Senate on Capitol Hill, and he also visited the Supreme Court. On February 27th, South Carolina Governor Francis Pickens wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis regarding the continuing crisis over possession of Fort Sumter. The seceded states had been taking over federal facilities and installations, including forts and arsenals, but two that remained under government control were Fort Pickens at Pensacola, Florida, and Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Tensions were particularly high in South Carolina, where the secession movement started, and dealing with the ongoing situation there was one of Jefferson Davis's top priorities. February 28th was a busy day. The Missouri State Convention met in Jefferson City to consider the question of secession. In Washington, the outgoing Congress was nearing the end of its session and so was cramming in last-minute business, including the formation of the Territory of Colorado. Down in Montgomery, the Confederate Congress passed legislation creating the Provisional Army of the Confederate States, a force equivalent to the Volunteer Army that will soon be organized in the North. And a week later, on March 6th, The Confederate Congress will also pass legislation creating a regular army, 
which Jefferson Davis envisioned as similar to the small, professional standing army which had been maintained by the United States. But since each of the seceded states are raising their own military regiments, virtually all new Confederate troops will be mustered into and serve in the Provisional Army. As the Confederate government assumed control of the crisis revolving around Fort Sumter, Jefferson Davis, on March 1st, appointed Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard to command the Confederate forces at Charleston. On March 2nd, in Washington, the 36th U.S. Congress was winding up. The Morrill Tariff Act was approved. Also receiving approval was a joint resolution to amend the Constitution, the proposed amendment stating unequivocally that slavery could never be interfered with by the federal government in states where it already existed. This proposed 13th Amendment to the Constitution, a desperate 11th hour attempt at accommodation by Congress, was never ratified by the states. On Monday, March 4, 1861, Abraham Lincoln was sworn in as the 16th President of the United States. Before taking the oath of office, Lincoln used his inaugural address to keep paths open to reconstruct the already divided nation. He assured Southerners that he had no intention of meddling with slavery in the states where it already existed because he had, quote, no lawful right to do so, end quote. But he also said that he was bound to defend and enforce the Constitution, and he believed the Union to be perpetual. He pointed out that, quote, no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination, end quote. He warned that secession was illegal and thus, quote, acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary according to circumstances, end quote. Lincoln reiterated, quote, one section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. This is the only substantial dispute, end quote. Lincoln reminded Southerners, quote, In your hands, my dissatisfied countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it, End quote. Directly following that reminder, Lincoln added his eloquent closing appeal, quote, We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. End quote. When the eagerly awaited text of Abraham Lincoln's inaugural speech was quickly published across the land, it was read, scrutinized, and dissected with rare attention. And although it aroused strong feelings everywhere, it changed few minds, since the response was generally along sectional lines. The address was either praised or condemned, depending on what was read into it. For example, the New York Herald stated, quote, Every word of it has the ring of true metal, end quote. While in South Carolina, the Charleston Mercury declared, quote, A more lamentable display of feeble inability to grasp the circumstances of this momentous emergency could scarcely have been exhibited, end quote. On March 5th, the day after his inauguration, Abraham Lincoln discovered that he faced an immediate crisis with regard to Fort Sumter. He was informed that Major Anderson had sent a message on February 28th stating that his supplies would run out in six weeks and that it was his opinion 20,000 men would be needed to relieve the beleaguered fort. Lincoln consulted General-in-Chief Winfield Scott, who agreed with Anderson's assessment. On Wednesday, March 6th, three Confederate commissioners who had arrived in Washington tried to make official contact with the new Lincoln administration. Jefferson Davis had sent the men north to attempt negotiations which would lead to recognition of the Confederacy's independence. On March 9th, President Lincoln held his first formal cabinet meeting. 
In a lengthy session, the men debated whether to evacuate Sumter, attempt to reinforce or resupply the strong point, or just what to do about the crisis. They knew that with Anderson's provisions running low, time was running out. The consensus seemed to be that evacuation of the fort was necessary. Aware that the three Confederate commissioners were in Washington and attempting to make official contact with his administration, Abraham Lincoln, on March 13th, told Secretary of State William H. Seward not to see the men, as such a meeting would be interpreted as an admission that the rebellious southern states had a right to leave the Union, which was a proposition that Lincoln would never officially accept or acknowledge. On March 15th, at an important meeting, Abraham Lincoln requested the written opinions of his cabinet on whether or not to resupply Fort Sumter. Five of the president's advisors opposed attempting to send relief to Sumter, while just two of the men, Treasury Secretary Chase and Postmaster General Blair, opposed evacuation of the fort. The cabinet meeting ended with the president postponing making a decision one way or another. On March 16th, the Confederate Congress adjourned at Montgomery. That same day, Jefferson Davis appointed William Yancey, Pierre Roast, and A. Dudley Mann as commissioners to travel to Europe and attempt to gain official recognition of the Confederacy, especially from Britain and France. On March 18th, Sam Houston, governor of Texas, was removed from office after the aging hero who opposed secession refused to take an oath of allegiance to the new Confederacy. That same day in Washington, Abraham Lincoln appointed Charles Francis Adams as the U.S. Ambassador to Britain and also named William Dayton as Ambassador to France. On March 21st, former Naval Officer Gustavus Fox was allowed to visit Charleston and Fort Sumter. Fox made the journey to South Carolina on behalf of President Lincoln. After meeting with Anderson, despite the Major's concerns over the feasibility of relieving Sumter, Fox remained convinced that a naval expedition of sufficient strength could break through to the fort. Abraham Lincoln held his first state dinner on the night of March 28th. That evening, General Scott told the President that he recommended the evacuation of not only Fort Sumter, but also Fort Pickens in Florida. Scott's reasons were political, not military, however, and this riled Lincoln, since the President knew it made no sense at all to evacuate Fort Pickens. The President later said that the idea of abandoning Pickens gave him, quote, a cold shock, end quote. Lincoln seemed to sense he had finally reached the moment of decision. Since taking office, he had tried to keep the secession crisis from boiling over into war. No troops had been called up, and no overt action taken. He had issued no inflammatory statements or threats that might arouse antagonism in the South, and this extraordinary restraint had led some to criticize him as weak and indecisive. But now Lincoln knew that time had finally run out. He had reached a great divide from which there could be no going back, whatever course he chose. The next day, March 29th, Good Friday, Abraham Lincoln met at noon with his cabinet. Someone, probably the President, raised the possibility of sending provisions but not reinforcements to Sumter, and notifying the South Carolinians of this peaceful mission. This approach seemed to offer an alternative between the extremes of withdrawal or reinforcement. Secretary of War Simon Cameron was absent from the meeting, but when the other cabinet members were polled, only Seward now opposed any expedition. Attorney General Bates, like you'd expect from a lawyer, hedged, saying, quote, I think the time has come either to evacuate or relieve it, end quote. But Gideon Wells had joined Blair and Chase in support of an attempt to relieve the fort. That same day, Good Friday, the 29th, the President ordered that preparations be made for a relief mission to Fort Sumter, writing, quote, I desire that an expedition to move by sea be got ready to sail as early as the 6th of April next. End quote. As James McPherson explains in his book, Battle Cry of Freedom, quote, Instead of trying to shoot its way into the harbor, the task force would first attempt only to carry supplies to Anderson. Warships and soldiers would stand by for action, but if the Confederate batteries did not fire on the supply boats, the reinforcements would remain on shipboard. Lincoln would notify Governor Pickens in advance of the government's peaceful intention to send in provisions only. If Confederates opened fire on the unarmed boats carrying food for hungry men, 
The South would stand convicted of an aggressive act. On its shoulders would rest the blame for starting a war. This would unite the North and perhaps keep the South divided. If Southerners allowed the supplies to go through, peace and the status quo at Sumter could be preserved, and the Union government would have won an important symbolic victory. Lincoln's new conception of the resupply undertaking was a stroke of genius. In effect, he was telling Jefferson Davis, Heads, I win. Tails, you lose. It was the first sign of the mastery that would mark Lincoln's presidency. End quote. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. On Monday, April 1st, after Seward presented the president with a plan for the Navy to reinforce Fort Pickens in Florida, Lincoln signed an order that the plan be carried out, and Seward complied. But the Secretary of State used such secrecy that Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells was not even made aware of the plan or of the schemes fitting out of the USS Powhatan, and so preparations for the Seward-backed Pickens expedition would ultimately conflict with those for the relief of Fort Sumter. That same day, the 1st of April, Seward sent Lincoln a paper titled Some Thoughts for the President's Consideration. The document reflected Seward's low opinion of Lincoln's abilities and not so subtly suggested that Lincoln allowed the much more experienced Seward to act as a sort of prime minister, steering the country's course with regard to domestic and foreign policies. Besides floating the idea of provoking a foreign war in order to unite North and South against a common enemy, Seward also advocated abandoning Fort Sumter, since, without Lincoln's knowledge, the Secretary of State had already led the Confederate commissioners in Washington to believe that the fort would shortly be evacuated. Lincoln answered Seward's paper by refuting each of the Secretary of State's points and making it clear that he, the President, was responsible for crafting the administration's policy initiatives. I must do it, Lincoln told Seward. The incident marked a turning point in the two men's relationship, and Seward will soon grow to respect Lincoln's abilities and will become one of the President's closest and most trusted advisors. On April 4th, the Virginia State Convention meeting in Richmond rejected 89-45 to 45, a motion to pass an ordinance of secession. On that same day, Abraham Lincoln informed Gustavus Fox that the mission to resupply Fort Sumter was a go, and the President drafted a letter for Major Anderson, letting him know that the expedition will go forward and hoping that Anderson would hold out until April 11th or 12th. 
Lincoln's note let Anderson know that if there was resistance to the resupply attempt, then the ships, quote, will endeavor also to reinforce you, end quote. The next day, Friday the 5th, Gideon Wells ordered three warships, the Powhatan, Pawnee, Pocahontas, and also the revenue cutter Harriet Lane, to sail with the Sumter expedition. But, unknown to Wells, the powerful 16-gun side-wheel steam frigate Powhatan had already left for Florida on Seward's secret mission to reinforce Fort Pickens. On April 8th, State Department Clerk Robert Chu arrived in Charleston and delivered Lincoln's message to South Carolina Governor Pickens. The President's note read, quote, An attempt will be made to supply Fort Sumter with provisions only, and that if such attempt be not resisted, no effort to throw in men, arms, or ammunition will be made without further notice or in case of an attack upon the fort. End quote. Pickens immediately shared the message with General Beauregard. On Tuesday, April 9th, the civilian steamer Baltic, with Gustavus Fox aboard, sailed from New York, bound for Fort Sumter. At Charleston, the Mercury declared that the attempt to resupply Sumter meant war. The next day, the 10th, after Jefferson Davis had deliberated the matter with his cabinet, Confederate Secretary of War Leroy Walker telegraphed Beauregard that if he were certain Fort Sumter was to be resupplied, then, quote, you will at once demand its evacuation, and if this is refused, proceed in such manner as you may determine to reduce it. End quote. On Thursday, April 11th, the surrender of Fort Sumter was demanded by the Confederates. Major Anderson refused, but revealed that he would be starved out in a few days anyway, if not battered to pieces first. When news of that startling admission was passed along to Montgomery, Jefferson Davis wired back that Beauregard need not bombard the fort if Anderson would state at what time he will evacuate Sumter. Late on the night of the 11th, the Confederate messengers returned to Fort Sumter and received Anderson's reply. He said he would evacuate on Monday the 15th at noon if he did not receive supplies or further orders from Washington. These terms were obviously unacceptable to the Confederates, since they knew a relief mission was on its way to Sumter, and so they refused Anderson's proposal. At 4.30 in the morning on Friday, April 12th, the Confederate artillery batteries around Charleston Harbor opened fire on Fort Sumter. At 7 a.m., the fort's guns started to reply, and so after months of rising tension, the Civil War had begun. The ships of the Federal Relief Mission started to arrive off Charleston as the bombardment was going on, but then they heard the guns inside the harbor fall silent. That was because, after 34 hours of bombardment, Major Anderson had agreed to evacuate Fort Sumter, and a white flag replaced the stars and stripes on the battered flagstaff. Amazingly, the only fatalities of the battle occurred on Sunday the 14th, when Anderson's men were firing a salute to the flag before they left the fort. An accidental explosion at one of the cannon killed one Federal soldier outright, another was mortally wounded, and several other men were injured. On Monday, April 15th, President Lincoln issued proclamations calling for a special session of Congress to convene on July 4th and asking for 75,000 militia to serve for 90 days to put down the rebellion. After the surrender of Fort Sumter, Lincoln issued his call for volunteers because by that time, the Confederacy had already enrolled about 60,000 men in its armed forces, while the regular U.S. Army comprised only some 16,000 soldiers. After the action at Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for militia to suppress the rebellion, the main question was the immediate future of the slave states that were still officially in the Union, that is, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee, Arkansas, Maryland, and Delaware. But then, on April 16th, Virginia officially refused the president's call for troops. By April 17th, all the free states had answered Lincoln's call for troops in the affirmative, but on that day, two more slave states, Missouri and Tennessee, joined Virginia in refusing to furnish militia to put down the rebellion. And in Virginia, the state convention adopted an ordinance of secession by a vote of 88 to 55. The decision was to be confirmed by a popular referendum on May 23rd. 
Also on April 17th, Jefferson Davis invited applications for letters of mark, which would allow Confederate privateers to seize northern ships on the high seas. On April 18th, five companies of Pennsylvania volunteers were the first troops to reach Washington, D.C. to assist in the defense of the nation's capital. The previous day, as the Pennsylvanians had traveled through Baltimore, the men had been roughed up by an unruly crowd sympathetic to the Confederacy. And then on Friday, April 19th, in Baltimore, rioters attacked soldiers of the 6th Massachusetts as the Bay Staters made their way through the streets of the crucial rail hub. Four soldiers and 12 civilians were killed. Tensions mounted as other Marylanders burnt railroad bridges and tore down telegraph lines leading to Washington. Many Northerners feared that the capital would soon be surrounded and cut off from the rest of the Union. Also on the 19th, Abraham Lincoln declared a naval blockade of the Confederate States. While not immediately very effective, in time the blockade will become a major part of the Union strategy for winning the war. On April 20th, in anticipation of a Confederate attack, Federal forces abandoned the Gosport Navy Yard in Virginia after destroying part of the facility and scuttling a number of ships. From the wreckage, the Southerners will be able to salvage the hull and engines of the steam frigate USS Merrimack. The remnants of the Merrimack will be rebuilt as the Confederate ironclad CSS Virginia. Also on April 20th at Annapolis, Maryland, home of the Naval Academy, the USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, was moved away from her berth as a precaution against Confederate capture of the historic old warship. On the 24th, the Constitution, under tow and with midshipmen from the Naval Academy on board, will depart for Newport, Rhode Island. Given the secessionist sympathies of many in Maryland, it was not considered safe to leave the Naval Academy at Annapolis, so Newport will be the school's home until August 1865. On April 21st, the patrolling USS Saratoga captured the ship Nightingale, which was carrying a cargo of 961 slaves. International trade in slaves had been against U.S. law since 1808, but even after that date, many thousands of Africans had still been transported illegally across the Atlantic to the states of the Deep South. Arkansas's governor on April 22nd turned down Abraham Lincoln's request for militia. In Richmond, Robert E. Lee, who resigned his commission in the U.S. Army two days before, was nominated by Governor John Letcher and confirmed by the state convention as commander of Virginia's armed forces. The next day, the 23rd, Lee would formally accept command of the Old Dominion's forces. On Thursday, April 25th, troops of the 7th New York arrived in Washington, much to the relief of the city, since, for several tense and anxious days, the capital had been cut off from the north because of events in Maryland. That same day, out in Galena, Illinois, Ulysses S. Grant bid farewell to his wife. He departed for Springfield to help muster in the local militia company he had helped form. On April 26, the governor of North Carolina called for a special session of the General Assembly and denounced Lincoln's call for troops. In Washington, the 7th New York's arrival in the city is followed by the appearance of other regiments from loyal northern states, and the nation's capital no longer felt so isolated and besieged. Ever since the Baltimore riots, tensions had been running high in Maryland. But then, on April 29th, the state's House of Delegates voted against secession 53-13. to Also on Monday the 29th, the second session of the Confederate Congress met in Montgomery. President Davis delivered a lengthy speech to the Assembly, reiterating the South's right to secede, stating that Lincoln's April 15th proclamation calling for troops was a declaration of war, and that all the Confederacy asked was to be let alone. On May 3rd, President Lincoln issued a proclamation calling for 42,000 volunteers to serve for three years unless discharged sooner. The proclamation also called for the enlistment of 18,000 sailors to serve in the Navy for not less than one year or more than three. The strength of the regular Army was also to be raised by 22,000 men. 
These measures reflect the possibility that the war might not be over as quickly as nearly everyone hoped. Also on May 3rd, General in Chief Winfield Scott proposed a strategy for fighting the Confederacy that included a powerful movement down the Mississippi as well as the blockade of southern ports. Those who expected the war to be over quickly, after one big battle, ridiculed Scott's proposal, calling it the Anaconda Plan because it would slowly strangulate the South. But Scott's plan nevertheless became an essential part of the Union's blueprint for victory. On Monday, May 6th, the Arkansas legislature voted 69 to 1 to sever relations with the United States. The same day, Tennessee lawmakers passed an ordinance of secession, subject to a vote of the people on June 8th. But for all intents and purposes, the legislature's action on May 6th was tantamount to secession. Also on May 6th, in London, Lord John Russell, the Foreign Secretary, rose in Parliament and announced the British government had decided to recognize the Confederate states as belligerents, but this did not constitute official recognition of them as a nation. An official proclamation by Queen Victoria will be released a week later, declaring Britain's intention to remain neutral in the American conflict, but according to both sides the rights of belligerents. This recognition of the South's separate status, although stopping short of official recognition, was still something the United States had wished to avoid. France would soon issue a proclamation similar to the British one. On May 8th in Washington, the architect in charge of the ongoing project to replace the Capitol Building's dome complained about the incoming volunteers who were being billeted on Capitol Hill, writing, quote, The smell is awful. The building is like one grand water closet. Every hole and corner is defiled, end quote. But by the time Congress convenes again in July, the so- soldiers will have been moved elsewhere, and the unpleasant odors will be-, be replaced by the more agreeable smell of bread, which is baked for the Army in 20 ovens located in the Capitol's basement. But even that enterprise will also be moved elsewhere after politicians complain of bread delivery wagons cluttering the Capitol's driveways and after smoke damage is detected in some books in the Library of Congress, which at that time was located in rooms in the Capitol building directly above the ovens. Blood was spilled in St. Louis on May 10th after U.S. Army Captain Nathaniel Lyon, fearful of a secessionist plot, raided a state militia encampment outside the city. When the Missouri militiamen refused to take an oath of allegiance to the United States, Lyon decided to march them under guard back into the city before issuing them a parole and releasing them. But as the prisoners and Union soldiers marched along, an angry crowd attacked the soldiers. In the ensuing melee, which became known as the Camp Jackson Massacre, two soldiers and two dozen civilians were killed. Also on May 10th, Jefferson Davis signed a bill authorizing the enlistment of up to 400,000 additional volunteers for three years or the duration of the war. On May 14th, George McClellan, already a major general of volunteers, was appointed a major general in the regular army, the highest rank available at that time. Although many regular army officers were senior to him in experience and length of service, McClellan now outranks all but General-in-Chief Winfield Scott. At a convention at Raleigh on May 20th, delegates voted unanimously for the secession of North Carolina. On that same day, the governor of Kentucky issued a proclamation of neutrality for his deeply divided border state. And then down in Montgomery, the Confederate Congress voted to accept Virginia's offer to move the Confederate capital to Richmond. On May 23rd, the citizens of Virginia voted 3-1 to in favor of secession, although in the mountainous western counties of the state, the vote was overwhelmingly against leaving the Union. That night, federal troops marched in several columns across the Potomac River from the District of Columbia into Virginia and seized Arlington Heights and the town of Alexandria. The Union's dashing young Colonel Elmer Ellsworth was killed after removing a secessionist flag from the roof of a hotel in Alexandria. The colonel's assailant, James Jackson, the owner of the hotel, was then shot down by one of Ellsworth's men. Also on May 24th, at Fort Monroe down on Virginia's peninsula, 
Union General Benjamin Butler refused to give up three runaway slaves to their master, a Confederate officer. Butler designated the slaves contraband of war, and the term took hold throughout the North. During the course of the war, hundreds of thousands of contrabands across the South will run away and make their way into Union lines. On May 25th, Union troops arrested John Merriman at his home in Maryland. An officer in the state militia and a Confederate sympathizer, Merriman was known to have burned railroad bridges to obstruct the passage of Union troops through the state. He was confined at Fort McHenry without formal charges, and his arrest provoked a storm of controversy over Lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. The writ had only been suspended twice before in U.S. history, but at times during the Civil War, both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis will suspend or seek to suspend habeas corpus. On May 26th, McClellan, from his headquarters at Cincinnati, ordered three columns of federal troops into western Virginia to protect the vital Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and to aid Unionists in the region. Also on Sunday, the 26th, after the pastor at the Congregational Church read a heart-rending description of the pitiful hospital conditions for Illinois troops stationed at Cairo, the people of Galesburg, Illinois, decided to send medical supplies along with a person formidable enough to demand corrective action by the military authorities. They chose Mary Ann Bickerdyke, a widow with two children, knowledge of herbal medicines, and possessed of a powerful determination. One of Mother Bickerdyke's biographers will later write, quote, It was pretty well established that when Mary Ann Bickerdyke took sides, her side won, end quote. By the end of the war, Bickerdyke will have accompanied the Union's Western armies deep into the Confederacy, aided the casualties on 19 battlefields, helped establish hundreds of field hospitals, and be instrumental in saving the lives of thousands of wounded soldiers. On May 28th, Brigadier General Irvin McDowell assumed command of the Department of Northeastern Virginia, which included the steadily growing number of federal troops in and around Washington, D.C. and Alexandria. On the last day of May, federal troops arrived at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, after withdrawing from their posts in the Indian Territory. The federal military's evacuation of what will one day be the state of Oklahoma left the five civilized tribes, which were the Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, but the federal withdrawal left them under the sway of the Confederates. On June 1, 1861, a skirmish took place at Fairfax Courthouse in Northern Virginia. Captain John Q. Marr of the Warrington Rifles is killed in the action, and his is generally acknowledged to be the first official Confederate battlefield death of the Civil War. Also on the first day of June, in Washington, an African-American laborer wrote in his diary, quote, Justice Clark was sent down to the Washington Navy Yard for to administer the oath of allegiance to the mechanics and laboring class of working men without distinction of color for them to stand by the stars and stripes and defend for the Union. And I believe at that time, I, Michael Shiner, was the first colored man that taken the oath in Washington, D.C., and that oath still remains in my heart. And when I taken that oath, I taken it in the presence of God, without prejudice or enmity to any man. And I intend to sustain that oath with the assistance of the Almighty God until I die. End quote. P.G.T. Beauregard, the hero of Fort Sumter, on Sunday, June 2nd, took command of the Confederate forces on the so-called Alexandria Line in northern Virginia, opposite McDowell's federal troops. On June 3rd, Stephen Douglas, the Little Giant, the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, died in Chicago. He had spent his last days tirelessly rallying support for Abraham Lincoln and the Union war effort. That same day, in mountainous western Virginia, Union forces surprised Confederates near the town of Philippi. It was a relatively minor skirmish, but the pell-mell rebel retreat was dramatized in northern newspapers as the Philippi races. Also on June 3rd, thanks to the influence of his brother, a U.S. senator from Ohio, 
William Tecumseh Sherman, a West Point graduate and former Army officer, was summoned from St. Louis to Washington to re-enter the military as colonel of a new U.S. Army regiment. He will shortly be reassigned to command a brigade of volunteers. Although Tennessee by this time was already an active member of the Confederacy, on June 8th, Tennessee voters approved secession by a large margin. Although the vote in the eastern part of the state was two to one against leaving the Union. That same day, Brigadier General Richard S. Garnett was assigned to command Confederate forces in northwestern Virginia in the wake of the embarrassment of the Philippine races. And on June 8th, Virginia Governor John Letcher officially transferred his state's military forces to Confederate control, which left Robert E. Lee out of a job as he had commanded the Virginia troops. But Lee still acted as advisor to Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who was now in Richmond. Also on the 8th, President Lincoln somewhat reluctantly approved the setting up of the United States Sanitary Commission, which was a civilian organization dedicated to providing medical care, supplies, and other comforts and necessities to federal soldiers in the field. Despite conflicts and infighting within the group, the commission did much during the war to benefit the health and welfare of Union soldiers. And then on June 10th, Dorothea Dix was appointed superintendent of women nurses for the U.S. Army. Dix will, over the next four years, work to organize hospitals, care for the sick and wounded, and establish the Army's first professional nursing corps, though her difficult personality and high standards will earn her the nickname Dragon Dix. Also on June 10th, about eight miles from Fort Monroe on the Virginia Peninsula, 1,200 Confederates defeat about 4,400 attacking Union soldiers at the Battle of Big Bethel. The Federals lost 18 killed and 60 wounded, while the Confederate losses were one killed and seven wounded. On Tuesday, June 11th, delegates representing the pro-Union populace of Western Virginia met in Wheeling to organize a Unionist state government. This will eventually lead to the formation of the new state of West Virginia. Also on June 11th, at the Planners House meeting in St. Louis, Nathaniel Lyon told Missouri Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson and Militia General Sterling Price that their pro-Confederate stance meant war. The next day, Governor Jackson issued a call for 50,000 militia to defend Missouri against what he said were federal efforts to overthrow the state government. On Saturday, June 15th, as a federal force led by Lyon marched on the Missouri State Capitol of Jefferson City, Governor Jackson and his supporters evacuated the capital and moved westward to Boonville. At the request of Illinois Governor Richard Yates, who had become aware of a discipline problem and incompetent leadership of one volunteer regiment, on June 16th, Ulysses S. Grant took command of the 21st Illinois with the rank of colonel. On June 17th in Washington, Thaddeus Lowe demonstrated the possible wartime use of aerial observation when he ascended in a balloon that was connected to the War Department by a telegraph wire, over which he communicated with President Lincoln. Also on the 17th in Missouri, after a short fight, Nathaniel Lyon scattered the pro-Confederate state militia that had gathered at Boonville. On Friday, June 21st, a convention of East Tennesseans meeting at Greenville proclaimed their preference for the Union and the Constitution. Around the 26th of June, impatient with what they perceived as a lack of aggressive military action against the Confederacy, some northern newspapers began to run headlines calling for an advance on Richmond. Day after day, Horace Greeley's New York Tribune will trumpet, quote, Forward to Richmond! Forward to Richmond! The rebel Congress must not be allowed to meet there on the 20th of July. By that date, the place must be held by the National Army. End quote. In Washington, at a special cabinet meeting on June 29th, Winfield Scott reiterated the military strategy he had proposed in a memo the previous month, the so-called Anaconda Plan. But then Irvin McDowell outlined his plan for advancing into northern Virginia and attacking the Confederate force concentrating around Manassas Junction. Under growing pressure from the northern public for some sort of immediate military action against the Confederacy, Abraham Lincoln chose to proceed with McDowell's plan. Lincoln's decision will lead to the war's first big battle, the First Battle of Manassas.
That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is The Civil War, Day by Day, in Almanac, 1861 to 1865, by E.B. Long with Barbara Long. As always, you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. And then before we go, we want to be sure to thank George C. from Michigan, Louise C. from Australia, and Benjamin K. from Florida for their donations this past week. So thanks, guys. And thanks to Spiritwood Music for their permission to use their song, Midnight on the Water, at the beginning and end of every show. And then thanks to all of y'all for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope you'll join us again next time when we take a look back at the rest of 1861. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. their donations this past week. Thanks, guys. And thanks to Spiritwood Music for their permission to use their song, Midnight on the Water, at the beginning and end of every show. And then thanks to all of y'all for listening to this episode of the Civil War. 18... <laughs> Start over. <laughs>